we'll continue with um, uh, the ministry word. And Michael here is going to just completely impart life into you. Completely. All I got to give you is what I got. All I got to give you is what I got. And um, humbly I say that. God bless you. So good to see you. And so you move back now. So what, what we'll, we'll pray afterwards, what you need to pray and what you have use for. We'll get the Lord working in that right away. So funny to see you. I still see it over in a little chicken running around out here. It's so funny. You're so, you look like such a woman now, you know. <laughs> you got a baby in there. <laughs> I can say that because I'm an old guy. So. Uh, check this out. The covenant that came to us in Ezekiel 36, that I'm going to give you a new heart, soft heart, and I'm going to put my spirit in you, and you will do my commandments. So I've never really run into a, a believer that wanted to uh, kill anybody or steal something. Uh, or actually, I have run into believers that uh, coveted their, their neighbor's wife. Uh, now, there's a few things to work out in some of that. <laughs> But what was the main thing that he said? You will do my commandments. Think about the commandment that is the most important commandment. It didn't pass away. Now think about this. We have the word of God. It's the living word of God. And we understand that he sent his word forth. And his word will not return void. His word will perform what it's sent forth to do. So the word, first commandment, thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. There's the word to you. And boy, that is the word. Everything else goes to produce that word. Everything else, everything else we can believe for, everything else we can hope for, everything else he's doing in our life is to bring that word alive in our heart. And it's, it's kind of interesting. Here at Celebration City, um, we talk to you as sons, not as sheep. But then as sons, we also have an operation of the discipling of sons. How to think as a son. How to walk as a son. Because that's what I got. As I share with you, what have I got? I've got that. How long? I've had that for four and a half decades as a son of God. I came into this as a son of God. I came into this without any, any idea that it would be possible to not love God with everything. And so... For me, it's been difficult in the sense of trying to minister to people who didn't have what I have. I didn't earn it. He just took me into heaven, and there it was. He gave it to me. Got it. Came back to the earth. This is only a year and a half, about two years after I got saved. Came back to the earth, and I, I, I have no idea what it was like to not love God with everything because he is everything. And it wasn't a thought in my mind. It was an absolute reality that he gave me in heaven. So throughout the years, I've watched that word more than any other word. I've had faith. Now, faith, the substance of what you hope for. I've had faith working to hope to get that. And then there's other areas that build into that, which are areas of love. Look in the, in the Old Testament. This is what he came back around over and over and over again, that you might love the Lord your God with all your heart. So he said that. I was going through Deuteronomy this week, and I don't know how many times he said that. That was his purpose in everything he was doing with them, to get them to love him. 
And he said, and, and if you love me, then I'll, I'll just totally bless you. He was like, he was like, he was like everything else was judgment, and it, but if you love him, it's just total mercy, blessing, blessing. Now, he's producing that fruit. So we know that in the, in the soul, we have the fruit of the Spirit, which is love and joy, peace, gentleness, goodness. But remember, the first one is love. I don't know how much we try to have love. New Testament commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Paul's complete admonition every, to every epistle is love one another with a self-sacrificial love. And so we, it, it's tough to work with this kind of love because it's not a love that necessarily I feel affection or I feel some attraction to this person or I feel some connection to this person. It's really not about the other person. It's about you. He is doing something in you Love casts out all fear. So as we go through and we're working in the areas of believing in faith to conquer different areas of our lives and different things, we know that almost everything that we go out in faith for, there was always, there was a fear there. Uh, well, maybe I, maybe I won't get healed, but I'll believe it. So the, you know, the knock on the door and and fear's at the door knocking and faith answers the door and fear runs away. Because faith works hand in hand with love. How many trials have you had with people who are believers because they didn't think the same way of you? You know, I always tell people, says, you know, don't, don't be so concerned about what you wear and what you look like, because nobody cares what you look like. They only care what they look like compared to you. So then you can be free from that. The love of God that's in you, producing a fruit that you might love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. And the trials, over and over. Woo! Look at that. Oh, we love one another so much. And then three years later, I hate that witch. Get her out of here. Human love is not the love of God. Earthly, human love. Love between man and wife is not the love of God. It can be, but in most cases it's not. It's like anything else in the world. It grows old, and it gets old, and it's old. <laughs> and things that are old, you just kind of don't want to look at them anymore. You want to deal with them. But the love of God is something that's, that's just so wonderful. For example, I could, I could imagine the Apostle John. I can imagine the Apostle John. No, let's go to Peter. The Apostle Peter. Now, he's going to show up in just a minute. I'll be right back. He's coming back. Peter's really old. And he's He's been through a lot of things after the Lord left. And he looks up at the crowd and, my beloved, love one another. Love one another. After 80 years or whatever it was that he made it through, that's what he had to say.
in this love, we first experienced it in our salvation, basic salvation. Maybe you were deep in sin, like many people, <laughs> just totally got one foot in hell when God revealed his love to him through the cross of Jesus, brought him in. Maybe you grew up in the church and you, you really never have known the love of God. It's just some, something that you think you should want, but you've never known it. He says, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. What manner of love is in your heart that God would call you a son? I think uh, as I look at you, it kind of reminds me that most men um, have a tough time getting into that kind of love until after that baby's born. But mama, she's into that love because it's right there all the time. And she's going with it. And she loves that baby. And she loves that baby right up into the ninth month and the ninth hour. And she's saying, God, deliver me from this baby. <laughs> That's still love. That's still love. That's just her little flesh screaming out, which, of course, mine would too if I was a girl. <laughs> Help, Lord. <laughs> deliver this baby. Oh. His love. Him. So there's, a, there's something that's so pure and so absolutely holy, which has to do with Jesus' relationship to the Father. Now, somehow we know that they're one, and yet there's Jesus and the Father. Everything that Jesus has the Holy Spirit is working to impart it to us. No man can know the Father except through the Son. How are you going to get through the Son? You, you have to love Him. Love causes you to absolutely die. To die for love is what Jesus was talking about. If you lose your life, you're only going to find it. Try to hold on to it, you'll only lose it. And this is they that love me, he said. They do my word. And let's just look at that word, love. What does that love mean? What is going to happen to you and to me when that love grows more and more and more and more and more in us? Well, one thing, more and more and more in the very express image of Jesus. So he said, pick up your cross daily and follow me. And we follow him. And it's a cross, which means that every day I offer up my life as a living sacrifice, holy unto God. A sacrifice is something that's dying, that's dead. Now, these, this is so simple, and yet there's something inside us that sometimes just really will fight against God. It will fight against love. That something inside of us is us. Self-centeredness. Person who wants everything that God has, except it won't love God. It wants what God's promises are, For itself. 
So, basic principles. I know these things can't be preached in most churches that I've been in the last 45 years. I remember going to one church uh, over here in, in Oregon, and uh, this is, well, I didn't go there. The pastor got 4,000 people in the church, and he came and wanted to talk to us, and, and we got to know one another a little bit, and he, he wanted us to join his denomination. And so I asked him one day, I said, well, you got four or 5,000 people in your church, the biggest church on the west side of Portland. And um, I said, how many, how, many, how many disciples do you have? And he kind of put his head down and he says, oh, maybe 150. Would you, do you guys teach the covenant of the New Testament concerning that by the stripes of Jesus we are healed? No, we can't. We can't teach that. We can't teach that. So what? What do you mean? It's 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 the New Testament. No, we teach that everybody in the place that gets sick. He knew that there was a trial for everyone, every faith that's believing in in God's life. To believe in God's life, to have the life of the resurrection Jesus, to have healing to have the prosperity, to have the blessings, to have the, the, all of the things that he died for, to have it would be a trial. And then I began to see the very simplicity of that trial. The simplicity of that trial, do you love God more than yourself? And that's impossible. That's just totally impossible for us to do that. So he said, I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to give you a new spirit. I'm going to put my spirit into you. And you will fulfill my commandments. And there is the new creation truth, the reality of Jesus dying on the cross, sending into hell, taking the keys of hell and death from the devil, being quickened back to life by the Father, rising up from the dead, making an open show of every demonic power and principality. And he said we could follow him all the way to the death of that cross, all the way to the resurrection of life. He fulfilled that word to love God with all his heart and mind and soul and strength. He fulfilled that word. Fulfilled it. Remember back when I was in business uh, years and years ago, came back from Israel and the Lord, uh, I had a little family and I needed to make money. So the Lord gave me an idea, I started a little business and in that business of the Lord opened up a lot of areas of faith, a lot of areas and principles that I saw in the Word of God on how to sow and how to reap to have this business go. Six years later, the business was in five different states in America. And in that business, every single bit of faith that I had to provide for my family and abundantly more to give started doing mission trips, started publishing the little sonship book and tapes and books. And, but I went to this, I went to this uh, conference with this guy. And <clears throat> at the early stages of that, and somehow I just knew that he had something manifest. He had something that was alive in him of something of business, a principle of business that was alive in him. And I believe if I went down to his conference, that's what a Christian conference, I believe if I went there that I could get what he's already got. He worked for it. He struggled for it. Whatever he went, went to school, whatever. But he had it, and it's producing in his life. 
I said, I'm going to get that. That was wisdom. Wisdom I tell you. You know, you're going to hang out with the dogs, you're going to be like a dog. You're going to hang out with a sheep, you're going to be like a sheep. You want to excel in something, you've got to go beyond you into someone who's already got what you're looking for and believe you receive it from them. You've got to go beyond you. You've got to go from the salesman to the sales manager to the office manager to the CEO of marketing to the vice president of the company, and then you get out of that and go into another deal. You've got to keep going if you're going to go that way. But that guy paid the price for something. How much school he got, I don't know, MBAs and doctorates and all kinds of stuff of this type of business. And I could go there and sit there, boom, and I could take it. Because I do have faith. You've got a lot of faith. Look at all the trials you've been through. You've got faith. And I got it. It was just a year and a half later, I had five offices across the United States. I didn't pay for it. I hardly had to do anything for it at all. That guy did all the work. And he's walking around boasting how he's got it. And if we follow all of his, all of his stuff and buy all of his stuff and get all of his information, then we could probably get it. There. No, man, there's a better way to get it. I just receive it right out of his words. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I got it right from him. Now listen. He had to leave. He had to leave glory. He had to leave glory and come to the earth and put on the likeness of a human He had to go through learning what human existence was all about. He had to look at all of the people. He had to watch his mom and dad and his brothers and sisters and the neighbors. Observing, observing, observing the operation. You know, a farmer is not out there out of, oh, man, oh, oh I hate this, uh, 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 uh. I mean, anybody that's really successful at doing their farm, they love it. They love doing it. They love those animals. They love those crops. They, they love that stuff. In other words, there's a love there that motivates them to do something. I've been watching the Olympics this week. A uh, couple of things I'll watch. I'll watch a couple of football games, American football, <laughs> throughout the year when I'm home. And then I always wait for the Olympics. Those are the greatest, incredible athletes anywhere in the world, tried and proved, going out there to justify their existence in 10 seconds. Justify their whole existence in a 100-meter race, 10 seconds. My gosh, what determination. What incredible sacrifice. And I, I watched the little gymnastic girls, you know, and, and, and guys, and how... Years and years and years of precise training and discipline. In their, and I thought, how can they continue? Get hurt, pain, no sleep, all kinds of stuff. And some kind of drill sergeant type of a, of a coach, just keep pushing you. Just keep pushing you. And if you break, you sit down and you take a break for a while or you leave the program. Uh, the ones that break and stay there, they're the ones that keep going. But what was it in them that caused them to keep going? And there was this one girl, American girl, who was a wrestler, a wrestler. And, I don't know, middleweight wrestler. America has never won anything in women's wrestling in the Olympics. And this girl won. And I saw her give thanks to the Lord, and I saw her breaking and breaking and breaking and breaking. She could not stop breaking. She could not. She was up on the platform to take the gold and have the thing, and she's still breaking. And it broke me realizing what sh price she paid for that vain glory 
that, what price for that 30 seconds of performance? Jesus knew. When he was 12, he knew that he was to be about his father's business. When he was 30, he knew the end of it. He had to take on all of your sin. Not just your outer sin that you do out in the world stuff, but the stuff inside, the very nature of sin that was in your soul. He had to take it all. He did it all. He fulfilled the word of the Father to love him, all his heart, all his heart, all his mind, all his strength, all of his existence, his being, his identity. He died for us. The price that we're paying to follow him every day is nothing. God may have you in ministry to where you, you have to do a lot of areas. You have to learn how to be a doer of a lot of areas of the Scripture that other people don't even see them, don't even see the Word. Maybe you're a wife. you got to do areas of the Word that this guy doesn't have to do. Maybe you're a businessman. You've got to do areas of the Word that another person doesn't do. But doing that Word brings us into more and more faith of his life in us. And we come to a couple of areas of Scripture that, that I know that we are working on in Celebration City all over the world. We have faith to believe his word. He's in us to believe the word that says that we were crucified with him. Everything about Michael... I always, it just cracks me up. Somebody finds a problem with me. Somebody's got to find some kind of, you know, they don't like me for this, or I did this, or I did that. I just, I just, all I can do is laugh. You know, because I, I laid hold of the Word of God that says Michael's dead. Now, other people might see Michael, but Michael doesn't see Michael. He's looking in faith of the Son of God who is his life. Now, if you heard what I said, I want to tell you, the freedom I walk in, I just hire all of you to walk in it because it's freedom. It is absolute freedom. You have that faith working in you because the Lord is in you to bring everything of you to the cross and everything of him raised up in you. Everything of him. It may be hard for you to get an imagination, get an idea about him being a woman having a baby. But that's what the Word says. You're dead. It's him that's alive. Or he's the daddy or the husband. But I guarantee you, 44 and a half decades later, I've learned that he is if I'll let him be. I can take my own stand and I can cry out, oh God, where are you? Or I can say, Lord, you're right here. Anything that's working through me that's not him, it's not me either. Sin, get out of here. The identity of a son is so simple and so pure and so holy and so righteous that you can take it without any fear. See, the fear of death is the strength, the fear of loss, the fear of not getting something, the fear of getting something. That's the strength of the self-centered. That's the strength of the I man, I woman. That's the strength. 
And Jesus made a statement about that in this parable. You can fall on the rock and it will break you. But if the rock falls on you, it will smash you to pieces. Simple little parable that nobody ever goes, what does that mean? What does that mean? <laughs> it means get out of the way. <laughs> oh, what? Are, oh, he did this and he did that. Are you talking to me? I'm dead. Now, the things I've gone through in four and a half decades, I can tell you, I'm giving it to you tonight. You can love God, and you do love God. You're just maybe not aware of it so much. You are a son of God. Maybe you're not so aware of it. But this is it. The Holy Spirit is in you. Then the reality of who you are as a son is increasing and increasing and increasing and increasing. And there's nothing you can do to stop it. You can run. You can run. Well, they hurt my feelings. Well, she hurt my feelings. Or you can die. If you've got feelings that can be hurt, I found out, hey, if I'm dead, why would I have feelings that can be hurt? Doesn't the word say that nothing by any means shall hurt me? Well, what, who me is that? It's talking about it's got to be the resurrected part. It's got to be Jesus in me. I always thought it like, oh, God's up there in heaven and he feels your pain. Let me tell you something. I've been to heaven. Ain't nobody up there feeling your pain. They're not feeling your pain up there. He's in you feeling the pain. He's in the body of Christ feeling the pain of unbelief and doubt and fear. That's where he's feeling the pain. That's where the Holy Spirit comes and the Comforter comes to give you comfort. There's nobody up there feeling any pain. They're not looking down here. But, oh, believe me, you out of that body, you're out of here. He did it all for you. All you have to do is accept it. Fall on the rock and it'll break you. But he's faithful. Hebrews talks about chastisement. What son is there that the father does not chastise? What are you being chastised for? Doubt, fear, unbelief, self-centeredness, pride. What son? He chastises every son that comes that he draws to them. Why? For your good. To set you free. See, freedom, there's no freedom in me being Michael. There's no freedom in me being Michael. Now, you see me that way, and I can relate to you, and we have a, have a soul, and we live here, and I can relate like that. But that's not who I am. That's not where I live inside. Uh, either Michael's dead, or I'm looking to put Michael on that cross every day that I'm carrying. At the end of every day, I want Michael totally dead on that cross. I'm following Jesus because I love God. And each day, my trial, your trial, is how much do I love him? With all my heart, all my soul. I can't do that. But he's alive in me, and he's already done it. He's already done it. All you have to do is receive it. To believe it. Amen? Amen? This is the life. This is Christ in you alive. This is the simplicity of all Christian religion. This is the epitome of every doctrinal dissertation about anything. Christ in you. The hope of glory. The mystery of the ages. The mystery of the ages is Christ in you, Jesus in you. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. Oh, thank you, Father.
Thank you, Jesus. This love, this love, your love manifested in us, changing us, delivering us, setting us free, even as your word said that we would be one, even as you are one. Thank you, Jesus. Men. So you've got something working in you toward another brother, sister. I know I just came back from Africa. We're still on, right, Donnie? Yeah. I just came back from Africa, and boy, I am telling you, it stirred up in me. When I first came back to the, to the world here, and I got out and found out what Christianity was doing on the earth, because I didn't have any idea about Christianity. I, didn't, I wasn't raised in it. And God sent me back with all, all that he gave me, and I, I couldn't understand the churches because the churches were all, they weren't anything like I imagined they were going to be. They are all divided off, and this doctrine and that doctrine, and all kinds of different methods, and, and all, all kinds of, it was just like confusion to me. And I spent some time going out, and God would have me go into this denominational church, the head of this, and spend some time there looking for two things. How do they understand the word? And how do they do the word? Okay, so then I gained that one, and then there was this other big denomination, and then there was this other one, and other one, and so I went from orthodoxy to to what they call radical Jesus, 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 what? Uh, Jesus freaks. There you go, Jesus freaks, radical Jesus freaks. <laughs> to learn how the people were being taught, what what to see, how to read the Word, and how to do the Word. And I, I got so in trouble in my soul because I got very critical because I come back to the earth with a full revelation of who I am as a son of God. I didn't have to grow in it. I mean, he just gave it to me. Took me to heaven and there. Okay? And... Nobody was teaching it. Nobody was preaching. Nobody was telling anybody about it. None of the leaders were doing it. None of them. I'm going, whoa. I got so critical toward them, so angry toward them. <laughs> kind of remind me of, of uh, one of the prophets who went to Nineveh, and then God didn't destroy Nineveh, and so he got angry at God, and he went up and sat on top of a mountain, and then he cried out to God, kill me, I don't want to live, this is not worth it. You, you just repented, you had me go and make a fool of myself. And then, then you know, and so then God uh, rose up this plant that came up to shade him from the sun. And so he was happy that the shade was on him. I mean, he just, you know, throwing dust on his head, just kind of, I don't know what kind of people those must be that do that, but he did. And then overnight, he sh God shriveled up the plant. And he went again, oh, this is worthless. I'm so glad I just want to die. And he said, well, what's wrong with you? Hey, I gave you the plant, and I took the plant away. Did you thank me for the plant? Did you thank me for it? I can do what I want to with the plant. That's what he was showing me, that parable about this is his field. This is his work. He can do whatever he wants to with the body of Christ. Those people can only teach, preach, instruct what they have what they know. That's all they can do. They can't do any better. The Pope, he can't do any better than what he's got. And guess what? Nobody's got anything except God has given it to them. Oh, there's a lot of deceptions and a lot of flesh and mind stuff and human stuff involved with it where the devil gets involved. But see, God still knows exactly what he's doing with the church. And I was really upset over that. It took me years to get that criticalness out of my heart to where I could just accept the fact, hey, that's not my planning. That's yours, Father. <laughs> I'm not responsible for that. You are. <laughs> I'm just responsible for what you give me to do. So I went to Africa this time. And... Had Paul over there for a couple of weeks uh, looking at everything, and he got really involved with churches and, and uh, got an amazing oversight of the body of Christ in Africa. 
And they are so upside down compared to things that we would understand. And they are so self-centered. The ministries are so self-centered. Everything's about the ministry, the ministry, the ministry, the ministry. And the ministry just sucks the life out of the people. God fills them up with some life. They come into the meetings and they feel the Holy Spirit and they have great, they have a lot of fun. Dancing, singing. I mean, they just have a party every time they get together. And then they walk out of there, not one bit of change in their life. And we got that testimony from several people we talked to. Not one change. How long have you been going to this church? 18 years. You go in there and have a good time. Have a great time. What's changed in their life? Nothing. Do you know that Jesus is alive in you? What? No revelation of Christ in them. And then this guy's on TV, okay? And I'm watching this guy on TV in this little hotel. And, and he's preaching the word that has to do with be a giver, be a giver, be a giver. Okay? God wants you to be a giver so that you can help others, so that you can give to others. He wants you to be a giver to the land. He's preaching that thing. And I don't know, he had four or five scriptures going on. And I could, as he, the more he talked, the more I could discern that what he's really saying is give to me, give to me, give to me. And then, right after I got that discernment, right there on the camera, and if you don't give, God's going to judge you. I am not joking. It's split, split that fast. I wanted to throw a Coke bottle right through that TV. I mean, I, and then, uh, so all the way through, it's been two weeks or so, I'm, I'm dealing with it because it kind of rose up that criticalness again. Kind of rose up that place. See, that criticalness that judging the other people in that, in that way is just totally flesh. It's pride. It's, it has nothing to do with God. It's not the love of God. In other words, it's, it, you know, this is the Lord's field. This is his, he can do whatever he wants to. You know, he's not letting the devil do anything that he doesn't want the devil to do. You ever thought about that? Yeah, you have. <laughs> It's kind of interesting how that works. But for you, you're to resist the devil in every case. Okay? So we love the Lord. And know that this is your goal. This is where you're going to. This is what's going to change you continually. This is what is changing. With all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And you will find that you are, as the scripture says, you are dead and your life is hid in Christ. And it's Christ who's alive in you. You got an earth suit on so that you can talk to earth people. And while you're talking to earth people, you walk around in the earth suit and there's things to do down here. You can plant gardens, you have a house, go, go snorkeling, there's all kinds of fun things to do. And you know, Jesus loves doing fun things. We, we've got the whole world here ahead of us and it's a blessing. The world outside of us is full of the curse. All they know is the curse. So they have to be greedy and they have to lie and they have to steal and they have to cheat because that's the only way you can get it when you're under the curse. <clears throat> but when you're in the blessing, it's there. Enjoying your life. Hey, look at this one. This is the one somebody gave me <coughs> years ago. Oh, oh, vain man that you are. You're going to love this one. Enjoy the wife of your youth all the days of your vain life. That's in Ecclesiastes. And so, okay, my life is vain. Enjoy my wife. I didn't hear the life is vain. I said, enjoy my wife. <laughs> so that, you're free now. You're free to do it. Enjoy it. You know? We're, we're to use the world, but not abuse the world. But it, you can't do that. You can't have that kind of fun. You can't, God can't have that kind of joy. I mean, he's got to be with us He's got to be in you for how many years that you're going to be on the earth. You think he wants to live under a bunch of curses? Does he want to live under a bunch of sickness and disease and worry and fear? And what's Trump going to do? And what's this guy going to do? What's that dumb lady going to do? And, and what are those Russians going to do? And what are those Chinese going to do? Did you think he would? Hey, we don't even care about that stuff. At least I don't. Because the Word of God tells me very clearly that he raises up whoever he wants to, to rule in the world of man. So let him do it. But that world's full of the curse. But my world's not. And neither is your world. 
not for the curse. You don't live in it. And why do I know you don't have to live in it? Because he is alive in you. It is he that's alive in you. He is your life. And out through you, out into this world, all of the blessings of Canaan land, all of the blessings that are of your soul. Do you know the most wonderful thing to do that when you wake up first thing in the morning is feel joy in your soul? I mean, it, you know, instead of feeling the in your body. <laughs> yes, it's possible. It is possible. It is a possibility, but you got to have a little faith, <laughs> and you've got it. Amen. Well, God bless you guys. All of you there in Romania, we'll see you soon, next week or the week, week after that. And, and uh, everybody here, God bless you. Continue on as though we are right here with you because we are one. You're going with us to Romania, and we're staying here with you because we are one. Amen. God bless you.